Fantasy Star Force speedruns are broken in so many ways that it nearly broke my brain to try and wrap my head around it. Thanks to a group of runners diving into the game's code, they were able to beat it in the real-time setting in almost under 30 minutes. But before we get to that, we need to go over how I stumbled upon this crazy game and community in the first place. One day a while back, I was doom scrolling a popular social media website where someone was asking about the most clutch endings to a speedrun they've ever seen. And I was reminded of this glorious clip by the legendary PPMA master, Big Fuang Balls. Me being the curious lad that I am, I decided to look into Fantasy Star 4 speedruns as I love runs that are filled with soul crushing RNG. When I went to look at some of the times on the leaderboard, something else caught my eye. And there I saw it, the any percent tab. Like a giant red button someone told me not to press. Prior to the middle of 2018, runs of the game were absolutely brutal, with swings of time being massive and runs dying almost anywhere. The goal of the game is to progress through the planets and defeat the final boss, Profound Darkness. This involves getting some key story items along the way, like the Elsidian for example. The No Major Glitches route doesn't have any crazy skips, just good resource management, well planned out battles with specific macros, and of course, a ridiculous amount of luck. In June of 2018, the record belonged to a runner named Tyler the Driver, with a time of 2 hours, 57 minutes, and 6 seconds. So the burning question is, how do we get from this behemoth of a run, all the way down to this crazy time? That's right gamers, it's time for glitches and cheating. Speaking of which, if you sub to the channel right now, we can try to overflow the sub button and set it back to zero, making me the biggest but smallest channel on YouTube. If that broke your brain, and you have no idea what that means, then good, sub anyway. A Fantasy Star series runner by the name of Jaseed was doing attempts of Fantasy Star 4 in early July of 2018 when something weird happened. Something so weird that at the start of the run, it caused the game to lock up and crash. Being the curious gamer that he was, he decided to figure out what was going on. As it turned out, he had found something called a menu glitch. Basically, this is caused by going into the battle speed and message speed windows and hitting the B button exactly 17 frames after the A or C input to accept in the menu. This also works with the macro menu if you press B 10 frames after accepting the created macro. Unfortunately, the only thing to come out of all of this was sometimes the game would allow the player to save anywhere. This was neat in concept for additional safety saving, but it was pretty useless in a speedrun. The no major glitches category world record holder took it upon himself to mess with it a little on the day after the post, and managed to do something weird with the save anywhere function. In the final area where you get the Elsidian, all of your party members are removed and normally you wouldn't be able to save. However, he was able to save, quit, and he even reloaded. And in doing so, he created a full party of Chazes. Now cloning a Chaz army was a really cool party trick, but all by itself, the glitch didn't really end up doing much. This coincides with the post from Jaseed on the same day, where he basically dumped a lot of testing information including a situation where he could hit an input that would allow him to move after selecting an option, with a menu still up. There's a lot of things that happen that seem to be random based on his findings, but it turns out a ton of factors influence what's going on, who's in the lead position, position on the map, and even what options you choose. Again, there's not a lot that's useful for the speedrun, but this is where things start to take a turn. Jaseed found that doing the glitch with the macro menu and twice in the same area allows him to seemingly go deeper into the game's code and access the menu. In his post, he speculated that with a Ryuka or Hinas option, things could get crazy. Okay, so I'm gonna stop for a second to explain something. For those who don't know much about the Fantasy Star series, literally everything has weird names and sounds like I'm speaking sort of some alien tongue. But real quick to explain, Ryuka is a teleport that warps you to any town you've been to, and Hinas teleports you to outside the current dungeon. Other people in the Fantasy Star speedrunning discord ended up messing with these findings and finding some cool stuff, from making goofy things happen like equipping a flame sword on Chaz and causing the game to crash right after, to accessing something that looked like a weird debug menu. Runners were having a blast with these newfound glitches. However, more serious work was going on behind the scenes. Another runner named Lady Starbird was getting info from someone named Lori who worked on reverse engineering Fantasy Star 4. On July 14th of 2018, Lady Starbird posted some findings from Lori, stating that the game keeps track of the number of open windows. Normally, when it reaches zero, you regain control of the characters from a mode switch. However, when cancel is pressed on the exact frame referenced earlier, the game calls the destroy window subroutine and decrements the counter. That means instead of hitting zero, it becomes negative and it messes a whole bunch of stuff up. This by itself is eye-opening, but again, it doesn't really do much immediately for what's being worked on. However, 
Lori did find that there are two other windows where the bug happens. The two other windows are the buttons option and the skill list in the macro. From here on in, we're going to refer to the normal menu glitch as the negative menu glitch and the negative menu glitch in the macro skill menu as the macro glitch. This will be important for later. A few days later on the 17th, Jasid started looking into the macro skill menu glitch and was able to make an additional command for a character that doesn't exist. Not just that, but it ended up being the skill Magid, which normally can only be used by Chaz. The only thing is the macro can't be kept around and thus can't be used, leaving this finding dead in the water. Thankfully though, after a few days of the game stonewalling Jasid, he had a massive breakthrough in a way that he didn't quite expect. The very next day, Jasid posted this video in the SRC thread. This was massive. Jasid had basically found a way to walk through objects using something called the Ryuka glitch. If you execute the macro glitch under certain conditions, you can press B and go back to the menu. If you press B the correct amount of times in the menu, then select a character who has Ryuka or a telepipe and use it, the normal sound will play and a blank window will pop up, allowing you to move. After executing this glitch, you can actually walk through barriers, NPCs, and even chests if you wanted. More importantly, Jasid found out that it can be done without too many issues in a real-time setting, which is huge for a trick that is basically frame-perfect. In this example, he skips getting Grizz, and he thinks it's possible to do it in the basement of the temple for Desilus skip. I could finish here and simply say that this is a walkthrough walls cheat code, but honestly it goes much deeper than that. However, there's a quick warning post from Lady Starbird before we go deeper into the abyss of these glitches. Some games really don't like it when you do things out of order, as certain events trigger certain flags for progression in the game. In her post, she mentions that an example would be getting Seth before going to Birth Valley, or getting Rune and Laddie a tower before getting him in Mulcum. These things tend to make the game break in pretty unforgiving ways. Back to our jolly glitch hunting, on July 28th, Jasid found out that you can do some more interesting stuff with the Ryuku glitch. While it's not possible to do the Desolus skip that was talked about earlier, after getting Rune and using the Ryuku glitch in a specific way, Aedo can be accessed and it allows for the bypassing of both Rika and Grizz. While this is cool, the really crazy thing is if you only have Rune slash Grizz and Chaz after the first Zeo encounter, you obtain a glitched character with a fixed inventory. Why is this important? Well, besides coming with an eliminator that's worth a cool 10k Meseta that generates infinitely, it opens up the concept of manipulating a glitched character's inventory, maybe to the point where it has an Elsidian which would be absurd because having this only 35 minutes into the run would probably break everything. While this game breaking revolution was happening, more and more runners started to mess with these glitches besides the ones who were there before. And on the NMG side of the community, runners were incredibly active in trying to push their times down toward the sub 3 hour barrier, with its crazy RNG and antics even attracting new runners during that time, like this guy. It's honestly pretty inspiring to look at communities back when they were flourishing with activity and new findings and I'm sure everyone involved felt the same way, especially after Jasid posted this much later, on the same day as his last post. He had managed to find a way to make macros happen with spells that the characters can't normally cast. This was massive. Basically, if you follow the how-to that Jasid posted, you can not only set up a macro with some glitched options, you can also break free of the minus menus that were piled up by scrolling through a few pages of items. Remember what I said earlier about your open window value the game keeps track of? Breaking free of the minus menus requires you to get back to that zero value that lets you move around, which is why the specific items and inventory scrolling is needed. So far, we have the negative menu glitch, macro glitch, Ryuka glitch, glitch characters, and the glitch macro abilities. Now I know this is a lot, but feel free to write these down just to remember them for later. While none of these have been implemented into a full speedrun due to the potential for something bigger, more people have taken an interest in unlocking the secrets that are what these glitches can truly do. One of our newer runners, Vio, has started messing around with some of the glitched macro abilities, posting some of his antics in the Discord, and he figured out a way to basically use Grand Cross infinitely with his post on July 30th of 2018. From here on, there's a lot of speculation from Vio and another veteran runner named Mormoth. Unfortunately, Many of Mormoth's messages are lost due to some issues that came up in the Great Turbo debate of 2018 that resulted in him leaving the server. While this leaves some missing pieces for discoveries that are coming up, I couldn't help but chuckle at the idea that Vio was talking to himself for what seems to be like 30 lines of text at times. 
continue with Vio in his quest for glitching glory through theory crafting, a few things did pop up in trying to find out how to skip certain places using the Ryuga glitch. For some reason, Mormont was able to do it in Monsen, wandering off the screen, with the town becoming glitchy, and he ended up in the edge without accepting the related quest. Unfortunately, with a situation like this, trying to take on the profound darkness isn't a good idea, as there's no way to edit stats like in Fantasy Star 2. There are an absurd amount of ways to break this game now, but unfortunately there's no way to pinpoint these ways to beat the game safely and quickly. As a wise man named Big Fuang Balls once said, The good news is that the possibilities are endless. The bad news, however, are that the possibilities are endless. With all of Eos and Mormont's ideas in the Discord hitting a wall, and no activity on the forum thread, the dust started to settle a little bit on the new tech and glitches. During that time, Vio was still hard at work and he found out how to do the Ryuku glitch with Hinas consistently. However, without any major new findings, things slowed down and discussion seems to stop entirely. Of course, as sure as the sun rises and sets, Jaseed comes back with another finding a month and a half later. And believe it or not, it's even more massive than the glitch macro abilities. Remember how I mentioned that you can get glitch characters? They don't really do anything, but they come with items and whatnot on them that could be worth a lot of money. Well, forget everything about that, and let me tell you about glitch characters and macro abilities. If you use macro A while they're in the party, it can have a variety of effects. There are specific requirements for this to work properly, but when it does, things get a bit crazy. Over the next few days in the Discord, Vio gets an idea of what's going on based on looking at the game's RAM when the glitch character macro happens. In the case of this Discord post, apparently battle speed was getting corrupted based on how the macros were set up. More specifically, the macro data was literally being moved to the battle speed data slot. Like I said, kind of crazy, right? It gets even crazier. It turns out, the shift doesn't just do that, but does it for things like event flags, moving them back to affect things in the late game. Masetta gets shifted into the inventory, allowing the player to generate whatever item they want, and it even shifts the inventory to the party, allowing you to get some weird glitch characters. Lastly from these findings, experience gets shifted into the character's levels, making for some weird level up sequences based on experience before the shifting, including drastically altering character stats. As such, with the values being shifted in the game's memory, the trick ends up being dubbed as the bite shift, as that's what's truly being moved around. Another thing we need to talk about are the game's flags I mentioned throughout the video so far. Each event has some sort of flag attached to it. Some are as small as determining if a chest is open or closed, and some as big as opening the edge at the end of the game. Activating or turning off these flags during parts of the game where they're not supposed to be changed can make the game really confused and even break in some situations. The main worry, besides having the correct flag set, is to ensure that the party is powerful enough after the shift to take on the late game bosses. Unfortunately, some characters after leveling up due to the experience into level shift end up having terrible stats, despite initially being super beefy. When Vio is working with Mormont to figure out some strategies, Vio sees that Mormont is getting shifts that are twice as big as his own, but it doesn't really affect his routing, so he just works with what he's got. Vio finds a way to take down Dark Force 3 and Reface, then realizes he needs to get to the ESP mansion to get the Elsidian for the edge. So after all this, and preparing for the final battle of Profound Darkness, let's see how this ends up going. There's an event flag that is set thanks to getting the Alshine near the beginning of the run, and when doing a bite shift, it moves that value to the flag that says Profound Darkness is dead, allowing runners to simply walk in and beat the game without resistance. The very next day, we actually end up having our first run. Vio posts in the Discord that he got a time of 1 hour and 48 minutes on September 23rd, 2018, despite many mistakes and a Chaz that had terrible stats. Vio posted all the bite shift info and the route on the forum for Jaseed to see and work with as well. Basically, the bites were shifted 4 values to the left in the game's memory, and in Mormont's case, this is 8 due to the mysterious double shift that he was experiencing. While Jaseed is dissecting this, Vio gets a 1 hour and 36 minute run on September 24th of 2018, using the same route as before. Regardless of all these findings, Vio is still set on trying to finish the game much faster by finding a way to open up the edge early. Unfortunately, 
Like with most glitches and the mysteries around them, it doesn't give up its secrets so easily. That is, for Vio at least. Jasid, on the other hand, had approached the problem in a different way, and in doing so, he found a way to Ryuka or telepipe directly to Rykros, skipping Dark Force 3 and Zeo, blowing those two bosses out of the route. It not only destroys the idea of a sub 1 hour and 30 minute run, it easily makes the sub 1 hour run possible. The only problem here is Vio can't reproduce the results Jasid attained. However, Vio did end up finding out how planet warping works. Normally, you can't warp to another planet with the telepipe or Ryuka, but after the bite shift, it's possible for the planet flag to be changed. In this case, the flag being set to 0 2 warps the player to Rykros when selecting one of the options for warping. Even though everything else can be done, including setting an event flag to open the edge, there's still a major problem with all of this, and it isn't just due to Vio not getting the same results as Jasid. When you return to Motavia to enter the edge, the game instantly warps you back to Piata, and the guards end up yelling at you as if you're at the beginning of the game. It turns out that the flag that marked Iglanova as dead is not set anymore, and even if you kill him again, since the edge is open, the principal gives you different dialogue and it doesn't trigger that flag. So unfortunately, you can't ever leave Piata after this point. Vio doesn't find a way to replicate what Jasid ends up doing, so he theorizes some other routes that could possibly work with this new concept, including a possible warp to Quran. Unfortunately, the world index for Quran doesn't let you warp there. As Ryuka and Telepipe don't work if your world index is set to anything but 00, 01, or 02. While Vio is trying to find many different ways to take on this massive puzzle of getting to the edge, it seems that Jasid's Rikros warp is the only thing that's going to cut out a massive amount of time. A couple of days later, while Vio is banging his head against the wall, he finally has a breakthrough with replicating Jasid's bite shift setup, and it's actually the same thing as Mormont was doing. The entire time, Vio was shifting only 4 bites, while Mormont and Jasid were shifting 8. So how was this happening exactly? What was the missing link? Remember those corrupted macros we talked about earlier? For some reason, when you have two corrupted macros adjacent to each other, and you cause a byte shift to happen, it does an 8 byte shift instead of the usual 4 byte shift. So for those of you out there watching and wondering what this discovery does for Vio, well, at the moment, absolutely nothing. The only good thing to come out of the whole ordeal for the time being is that the flag ensuring profound darkness is dead before the fight is still active after the larger byte shift. Over the course of the same day, Vio and Mormont work out some more theories with the 8 byte shift, but nothing really comes to light until a suggestion that Mormont makes breaks everything in half. Unfortunately, we'll never know what that suggestion is, but from what Vio was saying after the fact, we can see that the idea was big enough for a zero boss run. So after a little more theorizing from Vio, he found that whatever this was could be a sub hour route. He decided to go live with a run trying to take this game down, and something completely unexpected happened. Vio didn't just break the sub hour barrier, he absolutely crushed it, and it's all because of this. Apparently, Vio and Mormont had the same idea at the exact same time when doing the other route, and stopped what they were doing to look into it. The flag that is set when opening the 100 Masetta chests in the Piata basement actually becomes the event flag for watching the El Sidian cutscene after doing the 8 byte shift. Why is this important? If you go to Desilus and into the ship, the game starts the reunion cutscene that happens after getting the El Sidian. The big thing here is that the flag for opening the edge isn't active until that cutscene happens, and that also means runners can leave Piata again thanks to the principal not having the alternate text from the edge being opened. Vio was so tunnel visioned on trying to get the edge flag active that he didn't try to look for alternative routes. So on September 30th of 2018, the first sub hour speedrun of Fantasy Star 4 was achieved, and the best part? This was just the beginning. This route featured two separate 4 byte shifts and one 8 byte shift. This seems kind of difficult to manage and kind of slow, right? Well, Jasid thought the same thing. So around October 15th of 2018, he changed the byte shift route to include the 8 byte shift and not the other ones. This also includes some other minor optimizations to help speed things up. A few days later on October 18th, Vio attained a 3452 with Jasid's new optimizations. The main problem he needed to solve in getting that time was to ensure that Chaz or another character after the bite shift had good stats to get to the edge. This was something that was of concern before, but basically the edge has some really strong enemies, and if you can't tank or run away from them quickly, you can die many times before completing a run if you're unlucky. 
He knew that there was time to save here by grinding the route down, but him and Mormont decided to mess with some more glitches after Mormont got a weird crash when trying a route that talked to Saya. So the runners tried different consoles to see why this is happening. In the whole process of trying to figure out why this happened, when they tried to glitch on the same type of console where it worked, not only did it not occur the same way on console for Vio in comparison to Mormont, but during the investigation of the glitch, Vio realized he was on a console with the Sega CD attached. He went to unplug the Sega CD and try it again, and the results ended up being really weird. The Sega CD Model 2 was influencing the outcome of the glitch by simply being connected to the Genesis. With the Sega CD attached, Vio was able to get a 3332 on October 23rd of 2018. Now before everyone watching starts freaking out and uses this video as a case study on why having to buy ridiculous hardware sucks for speedrunning, it turned out that the trick also works on a Model 1 Genesis with no Sega CD thanks to some testing by the one and only Big Huang Balls. A couple of days later, Vio was able to get a 3318 with no major changes to the route on October 25th. This run basically lost a minute and was able to still beat out the record by 14 Guess what, new Jaseed route just dropped and it skips the Iglo Nova cutscene, saving some massive time. With that and other small optimizations, Jaseed achieves a 3043 on the same day. The only issue with this route was Chaz's stats for the edge were a little bit sketchy now, so it required more good luck in the edge due to reasons I mentioned earlier. After this run, things get quiet for the next few weeks in regards to any percent. Mormont had done a few runs of the category, but nothing that pushed the fold in a way that would get the sub-30, and Vio was actually figuring out what was really happening with the byte shift. After a couple of months of not knowing why exactly bytes were being shifted, he finally found out the secret to the whole thing. The game was simply trying to figure out what the turn order was. Let me explain. When you use the glitch macro while a glitch character is in the party, when it tries to figure out the turn order of Demi and Rika in the case of this run, it can't. Normally when the game wants to move a character down the list for the next turn, it'll shift the next character down by 4 bytes. For some reason, the glitch macro never lets this process stop. Not just that, but because the last two characters are behind character 255 in the party order, they're not added to the list of fighters in the battle. Basically, they're both in the battle and not in the battle at the same time. As a result, the game can't find them and loops the RAM and even the ROM thousands of times trying to find the characters. Also, while dropping this cool knowledge, Vio gets a new record of 30 minutes and 20 seconds on November 18th, 2018, and vows to never touch any percent glitched ever again due to how Kaizo it is. Apparently everyone else followed suit because the SRC leaderboard doesn't feature other times than the ones posted, with Vio still being at the top. However, if you've seen some of my other videos, the human limit of speedrunning isn't the full story. While all this was going on with Vio's progression of getting the RTA world record, Jaseed was looking to do something more, to make a tool-assisted speedrun that used everything that the community had put together over the last couple months. And just four days after Vio's legendary run, Jaseed submitted his tool-assisted speedrun to the Task Videos website for judging. On December 24th of 2018, Jaseed's task was published with an incredible time of 20 minutes and 33 seconds, featuring many optimizations over the real-time run. This was the fastest time that this game would ever see. However, our story isn't over yet, because there's one more thing we haven't talked about. You see, with the introduction of Turbo into the community, it not only allowed for saving one's hands from injury due to mashing, but it also allowed for RNG manipulation via continuous movement and consistent saving and loading of the game to reset and pick back up as needed. This RNG manipulation isn't exactly allowed with any of the current leaderboard rules, so any times with this strategy are not on the leaderboard, but Jaseed came back with this behemoth of a speedrun on February 1st of 2019, with a time of 28 minutes and 30 seconds, which is technically the fastest time ever done in a real-time setting. I wanted to include this one, as I personally believe it's important to keep track of runs like these, regardless of their eligibility to be submitted to a leaderboard. It's a good lesson in understanding that leaderboards and speedrunning communities are not exactly everything, and people can run games in any way that they feel like. Coming back to the Fantasy Star 4 community and looking at everything they've done to completely dismantle the game, it's just another example that in most cases, no single person can solve these mysteries by themselves. It requires a collaborative effort that could take long hours over the course of weeks, even months as shown over the last however long this video is gone. As they finished typing this out on a quiet Saturday night, 
I can't help but feel a sense of awe when looking over how much these people have changed the game, and all because of a complete accident. Stay hydrated, folks, and thanks for watching.